Good evening, this is Pastor Mike Creekmore, pastor at Bimini Baptist Church in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. It took me just about a couple of minutes having some connection problems, but I'm on now. And I want to remind you to uh, be praying for the election results as those results continue to trickle in. I hope that you're praying for all of those results and regardless of who wins president and regardless of who's in the Senate and the House and all that other stuff, the governorships and all of that, just be reminded that God is still on the throne and that God is still in charge and in control. And so we can be encouraged tonight to know that even in difficult times, and unprecedented times in a year like this, 2020, uh, we probably wouldn't have expected an election any different than we're having right now. But thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, God is on the throne and God is in charge. So let's look at the Ten Commandments tonight. And as we look at the Ten Commandments tonight, we're continuing our study with commandment number six. Commandment number six is a really short one, but an impactful one. Do not murder. Let me read that one more time from God's word. Just three words uh, there in Exodus 20, verse 13. Do not murder. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, tonight speak to us. Tonight, help us to have some insight into these three uh, words that seem as though they might not mean a lot, but oh, they do. Lord, I pray that you'll teach us tonight, and Lord, help us uh, to understand what it is you're trying to say to us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We lift up this country. We lift up every single vote that is to come in and those that have been cast. And Lord, we thank you that regardless of any outcome, that you're on the throne, that you're in charge, that you're in control in spite of it all. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A Sunday school teacher was discussing the Ten Commandments with her five and six year olds. She asked the class if there was a commandment that teaches us how to treat our brothers and sisters. One little boy raised his hand and said, thou shalt not kill. Perhaps none of the 10 commandments have been misunderstood, misinterpreted, and misapplied as the sixth commandment. The sixth commandment uh, was given for both the promotion and protection of life. It is a commandment that places great premium on life. It underscores the value of the life that is given and enjoyed by each person and seeks to protect that gift. As we continue tonight with the Ten Commandments, and particularly commandment number six, I want us to glean some lessons from this commandment tonight. First, we look at the sixth commandment, and the first thing that I see is it defends the sanctity of life. The sixth commandment reminds us that there is something holy and sacred about life. It is also it is so sacred that God clearly prohibits and condemns the taking of that life by another. Uh, this commandment says, you shall not kill. Uh, actually, in the Hebrew, it says, do not murder. Those words are a law of God for the protection and defense of the life that we've been given. As I said earlier, this commandment has been misunderstood and misinterpreted through the ages. What did God mean when he said, do not kill? 
First, let me say that God was describing an act by the hand. To understand what God meant, it is important to understand the Hebrew word for kill is a word that speaks of murder. The sixth commandment actually reads, thou shalt not murder. Do not murder. The word comes from a root word, which means to dash to pieces. It describes someone's life being willfully and wrongfully taken by the hand of another. It is what we would call murder in the first degree or homicide. It, uh, this is important for us to understand because there's a difference between killing and murder. It is possible to kill and not murder. All murder is killing, but not all killing is murder. In the Bible, you will find that not all killing is murder. For example, in Numbers chapter 35, we read about the cities of refuge. These were 10 cities that provided a haven for safety for someone who accidentally killed someone and needed protection from an angry or vengeful mob. The killing is described by accident or occurred by accident. It was not on purpose. Such killing would not be classified as murder. Capital punishment would be another classified, uh, would not uh, be classified as murder. Yes, it involves killing, but it is not killing that is identified as murder. Uh, shortly after histories of the first murder, God established a principle that the consequences for uh, one intentionally taking the life of another was the loss of their life. We read in Genesis, nine death would not be. As you look in the Bible approximately 30 times, you find God commanding his people to use force and engaging in war to carry out purposes that are just, moral, and defensive. When God says don't kill, he's talking about intentionally taking of life by the hand of another. God is saying, you shall not murder. Now, I know that many of you are thinking, you know, this commandment is really not for me. It doesn't have anything to say to me. So I don't know that I even need tonight to be listening to this message. Well, I thought about that and I thought about that. And I know some of you are saying I hadn't killed anyone, but I thought about it a time or two, but I haven't actually carried it out. However, it is possible that we're guilty. As you look in the Bible, you will find that murder is not only by an act of the hand, but Jesus also described it as an attitude of the heart. God not only established this sixth commandment to say some things about the, the hand that participates in it, but also he describes the heart. Jesus took the sixth commandment and expanded it to include being filled with hate and anger toward another. Uh, the word angry uh, that he used speaks of being filled with rage. Jesus was talking about rage, the kind of anger that results not only in murder, but also results in a murder of friendships, relationships, reputations, and also even steals our own happiness. We may not be guilty of actually committing murder, but Jesus tells us that if we're angry with someone without a cause, we face judgment just the same as the one who commits murder. Whether it is an act of the hand or an attitude of the heart, God's command is, you don't kill. You shall not kill. Killing uh, violates the command of God. So not only does this commandment describe the and defend the sanctity of human life, but also this commandment declares the source of life. 
Now I'm going to get down to brass tacks right now. I'm going to get fired up in this message because I really like this second point. It declares the source of life. Who gives this command? Where does this law originate? It comes from God. It is the giver of life that issues this command. You shall not kill. It comes from God. The commandment is not only about the defense of life, but also draws attention to the defender of life. God gives us life and defends the very life that he gives us. <coughs> Excuse me. This reminds us of a couple of things. Our existence is dependent on God. God is the source of life. Let me say that again. God is the source of life. It is God alone who brings life into existence. The Bible teaches us that God who gave man life, it was God who gave man life. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth breathed, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. God formed man and gave him life. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so I want you to understand that our existence is dependent on God. But also, and, and here's where this commandment really comes in. This is where the rubber meets the road. Our end is determined by God. I think about a little boy that came running into, his, uh, into the room. The little boy said, Mommy, Mommy, I saw a rat in the basement. I cornered it. I kicked it. I stomped it. I grabbed it by the tail. And then I threw it across the room. I got my baseball bat and I began beating it. By that time, he noticed that uh, the preacher was sitting there. And he paused and bowed his head and folded his hands. And he said, then the dear Lord called it home. At the very soul of the sixth commandment is the truth that God is God. And God alone is responsible for the expiration of life. Let me say that again. God alone. I want you to hear me, my friend, tonight. God alone is responsible for the expiration of life. In Job 14, 5, we're told that our days are determined by God and uh, the number of our months are in his hands. It is God who gives life, and, he, and he's the one who says when our life should end. G. Campbell Morgan, in his book on the Ten Commandments, writes this, and to terminate a single life is to set up the wit and wisdom of man as superior to that of God. I doubt that a murderer ever thought about it, but when they chose to take the life of another they are taking upon themselves a role that is reserved only for God. Only God has the right to terminate life. Only God should be the one who says when life should end. Only God has the right to end life. It is this truth that causes me to have problems with such Forms of killing known as euthanasia or abortion. We may call it mercy killing if we like. And in some cases, our hearts go out to the one suffering. Nevertheless, it is not right, uh, the right of an individual or doctor to determine when a person should die. The same is true when it comes to abortion. It may be the law of the land, but it does not make it right in the eyes of God. Only God has the right to determine who should live and who should die. I want you to hear that. 
This is not a human privilege or human responsibility. Whether it is a sin-hardened criminal or a doctor, no one has the right to terminate life. To do so is to assume upon ourselves a role that belongs to God as well as to commit murder. You need to read this sixth commandment. You shall not kill. And you could also add to this commandment, do not murder, do not kill anyone. You do not have the right to determine when life ends. You could add that with an exclamation mark tonight. Let me give you another thing that I thought about as we study this text tonight. I know it's only three words in uh, the translation that I read tonight, but let me tell you, Oh, the impactful significance of it. It displays the significance of life. This command tells us about the significance of life. God's law and commandment for the protection of life indicates that God has placed a great premium and value upon life. Your life is valuable. My life is valuable. God has an awesome plan for your life. And God has an awesome blueprint for my life. And my friend, tonight we celebrate life. We celebrate the sanctity of life, the sanctity of human life. And we also understand that God is the originator of life and he can only be the one who expires life. So, with all that said, let's look at the, the physical significance of life. Of all the commandments that address our relationship with one another, there is a seriousness about violating the sixth commandment, unlike the others, the, the others that we've gone through and will go through in this study. If a person steals from someone, for instance, uh, they can make restitution or restoration. However, when someone takes the life of another, it is irreversible. You can't backtrack. You can't undo it. It is impossible to give that life back. Death is final. God's command underscores this physical significance of life because we're giving only one life. I only have one life. You only have one life. One life to live. And God jealously guards that life within the confines of his law. It's his law. He made it. He gave you life. He gave me life. And his laws govern your life and my life. <clears throat> and so we have the physical significance of life. But how about the spiritual significance of life? As valuable as the, the physical realm is, the spiritual realm is, is all that much more significant and valuable. The life we have been given is a gift from God and endowed with a divine purpose. That purpose begins with our coming to Christ, accepting him as Savior and making him Lord of our life. Once you know Christ as Savior, then you can discover and fulfill God's great purpose for your life. You don't begin to understand God's plan for your life until you come to his son, Jesus. And through a relationship with Jesus, you become part of God's family. Jesus bridged the gap. We can't get to God. Our sin has separated us 
from God, but Jesus came to bridge the gap. And when we accept God's only begotten son, Jesus, into our heart and life, we become part of God's family. And once we become part of God's family, we begin to understand the great purposes of God for us. Understand, this is maybe the most important statement that I'm going to make tonight. Understand that when God said, thou shall not kill, he wanted to do more than keep you alive. He wants you to live. He's doing more than keeping you alive. He wants you to live. And how do you live? You live in the abundance of God's grace, in the abundance of God's mercy, in the abundance of what God wants to do for your life and my life. And folks, we can never reach that abundance until we are birthed into God's family. We never reach our potential until we know God's only son, Jesus, as our Savior and Lord. And so tonight, I encourage you. God's doing more than just trying to keep you alive. And he's not trying, by the way. He controls it. He wants you to live. Live in freedom, live in abundance. Live in the joy of the Lord. The joy of our salvation. I'm glad I'm saved. This is not my home. I'm only passing through. Heaven is my destination. This is my temporary residence. But my eternal home is waiting for me on the other side. And folks, that's what I get out of this command. You shall not kill. You shall not murder. Don't murder. Do not murder. That's what I get out of it. It's more than really what meets the eye. It shows us God's big plan for your life and God's big plan for my life. And that's why, that's why I can take a chill pill and chill out a little bit in 2020 as unusual as this year's been. And as, as, as weird as this election has been, I can chill out because I know that God controls it all. And let me say this, God controls your life and God controls my life and God is the author of life, the giver of life. And it is a gift. And let's celebrate that gift tonight by carrying out the purposes of God in our lives. That's how we bring a smile to the face of God. When we live in his plan and his purposes and his uh, not only way, but will, the perfect will of God, I'm right where God wants me. It makes a difference. God bless you. Let me pray as we close tonight. Thank you. I enjoyed this little command, but oh, what a big command it is. I've enjoyed it tonight. God bless you. Let me pray for you as we close out this session of teaching. Lord, tonight, uh, we thank you for this command. We thank you for what it means because um, you've got a plan, you've got a purpose, you've got uh, a roadmap for our lives. And help us to live within the scope of where you want us to be. Lord, we love you. We praise you. I do lift up the Glover family. We have her funeral on, uh, coming up on uh, Saturday. We pray for that family. We still have some sick people in the church. Uh, also, uh, Miss Tobert, I got a message that uh, she is continuing to have 
uh, many, many physical difficulties. We pray for her, her son, Heath, and also Shannon, the family. We lift them up. And dear Father, uh, I'm sure there are many, many others out there uh, that need prayer. We have many shut-ins. I lift them up. And uh, we've had people have surgeries. And uh, I lift them up. And of course, we've had uh, two families recently and two funerals within just a few days of each other. And we pray for both of those families tonight, uh, the Regis family, uh, the Price family, and also the Glover family. Uh, we lift all those families up and thank you again for all that you do for us. Praise God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, and, and I just saw, i tell you what, I just saw Roger's name right there on the list tonight. Let me pray for him because he's been going through an MRI and some back and neck and, and some nerve issues. I'm going to pray for him uh, right now before I sign off. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I lift Roger up, uh, just a great friend and um, great, uh, a great preacher, and we pray for him. And dear Father, uh, we lift up all his pain. He's been in enormous pain in recent days uh, with a, a nerve and neck and back issues and MRI and all that going on. We lift Roger up. We pray for Pastor Roger and we lift him up. And as I pray for Roger, I sing about Pastor uh, David Gallimore in the East of South Carolina. We continue to pray for him. And dear Father, um, I'm thinking about uh, uh, a teacher that uh, Kim su uh, subbing for this week, next week, uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, we pray for him. Uh, he's just been diagnosed with COVID. We pray for him. And Lord, we just give you all these people right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're going to be in the parking lot one more Sunday uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, we'll be in the parking lot back inside on the 15th. And so uh, if you're listening and you don't have a church, love for you to come out our parking lot Sunday morning. God bless you. Have a great, great night and uh, keep praying for all these people. God bless you.